the truth is out there. It is one of the world's greatest mysteries, Scotland's legendary Loch Ness Monster. So does the lake creature actually exist? Well, if you ask one man, he'll tell you it is in fact no myth. Every day it's flaunted in front of your face. Hundreds of people in the valley say they are hearing voices in their heads. You just choose to ignore it. Belief can be a powerful force. No one knows that better than the people who are sure they've seen Bigfoot. Real accounts. He says he knows who's playing mind games. Rogue government officials that are uh, sponsoring this. Um, also corrupt business officials and um, private citizens. From real people. Hundreds of people turned out tonight for the unveiling of a very controversial statue. Yeah, it really is. The Satanic Temple of Detroit revealed the one-ton bronze statue. It's time for you to take a swim. I'm just excited to see my Lord and Savior Baphomet represented in such glorious Italian stone. I do hope his eyes gaze upon me and that my allegiance is recognized. In the dark waters. The Dark Waters channel is for entertainment purposes only. Although information in these stories can be traced back to relevant and true sources, Dark Waters strongly discourages its viewers, listeners, and subscribers from visiting the site of incidents and encounters discussed or revealed on the show. In other words, we will not be held responsible if you are attacked by a dogman, molested by a Bigfoot, bitten by vampires, chased by chupacabras, abducted by aliens, accosted by the men in black, investigated or arrested by the local law enforcement, CIA, FBI, NSA, EPA, BLM, or another alphabet group, whether on U.S. soil or abroad. Thank you for tuning in, and enjoy the show. Long before we visited Ruby, Alaska, before the death, the blood, the stinging pain of loss, before it was revealed to us that the world was full of hideous monsters and that the elites of the world knew of these creatures and used them to suit their needs, before we met Vital, Ben, and Chef, it was just Steve and I, two men who traveled the world, searching for a good time, aimlessly wandering without a purpose, having the time of our lives. So tonight, I take you back to the beginning. How it all started, when we first realized that the world is not what it seemed, and walk you through the events that turned us into what we are today, Monster Hunters. hours may 1st 2004 steve and i are in belize having the time of our lives oceanfront resorts great food beautiful women if you've never been to belize you need to put it on your bucket list and the women oh my god amazing with skin tones ranging from the creole colors of new orleans to the smooth dark chocolate of south africa in those days long before we learned about the evils of the world roger and i only cared about traveling and i'll never forget that night I was beachside with the most angelic being God ever created. What was her name again? Oh, yes. Alicia. Alicia. How could I ever forget her? She had these eyes that peered into your soul. You know, if things had gone differently, I could have seen myself marrying a woman like her. Beautiful, intelligent, and from a family of means. Alicia. Yeah. Roger was a few feet down from me, drinking and entertaining a group of three women, running his usual mind control language patterns, <laughs> talking about feelings and using words like imagine this and, and presupposing that all three of them will be having sex tonight when his satellite phone rang. You know, sometimes I wish that he had never answered that phone call. I sit back and wonder how lives would have been if he had just taken those women back to his room instead of taking that call. It was that very phone call that set us on the path to becoming monster hunters. The phone call was from a man named Sorkin. You see, Sorkin had his eyes on this gold-rich land outside of San Carlos, Venezuela. Locals there were pan mining the area and selling lots of gold. And as for Sorkin, best way to describe him is a globalist. He had his hands in everything. Drugs, guns, prostitution, diamonds, gold mines, oil. 
You name it, he had access to it. Countries didn't matter to him. In fact, borders didn't exist to him. And rules? Shit on rules. They didn't even apply to Sorkin. One day he told me Hugo Chavez was just a pissant dictator to him. You see, I'd only met him once before. Roger and I got an invite to hang out with him and his sons at their box suite at the Dallas Cowboy Games. And I had never seen anything like this in my life. I mean, the power this guy had? Congressmen, diplomats, foreign ambassadors. Everywhere we went, somebody was kissing his ring. And somehow, Sorkin and Roger's dad were good friends. But looking back on everything, I don't even know how he fucking knew we were in Belize. From within 24 hours of that phone call, we go from drinking and partying to doing business. Sorkin's business. He makes us an offer, and a good one at that. Just for reaching the location and securing it, we would get 3% equity in the mines. Now, of course, with a man like Sorkin, 3% really means 2% or 1%, but we really didn't give a damn. It was an adventure, and we were adventurers. The following morning, Steve and I caught a flight from Belize to Caracas. Then, shit got a little shaky. We boarded an old 1981 Cessna plane for the most dangerous flying I have ever experienced in my life, hopping from city to city, from, from Caracas to St. Fernando. And when we landed in San Fernando to get fuel, we damn near lost a wheel on the plane. Potholes all over the runway. After fixing the wheel and several other close calls, we landed in San Carlos de Negro. Now, not to be confused with San Carlos. San Carlos de Negro is a small city. It rests right upon the Rio Negro River. And the guy that Sorkin had put us in contact with in the area was named Juan. Now, I'm not going to tell you everything that Juan did, but I can tell you this much. San Carlos de Negro is on the border of Venezuela and Colombia. This guy does business with Sorkin and spends a lot of time in the jungles. Catch my drift? As far as San Carlos de Negros, the color of the city is uh, a bit of an overstatement. This place was bare bones. A village is more like what I would call it. Stray dogs everywhere, poverty like nothing I'd ever seen. We jump in the back of the Jeep with Juan and his right-hand man, Dantes. Now Juan, really was nothing special to look at. Small man, weighed no more than 185 pounds and stood about 5'10". But Dantes, his boy, looked like he had been through a rough life. He's about 6'3", very slim. But he had the eyes of a killer. You know those cold, dead eyes? Soulless? And his head must have been split open like a melon at some point in time. Because the scars on his face and the stitch job? Man, imagine a skinny Latin version of Frankenstein with tattoos. And what was even more disturbing about Dantes was, he didn't say a word the entire time. He was just there. We drove for what seemed like about an hour through the jungles. And then we arrived at this clearing. Had these fancy huts. Juan's operation was something major. Talking about 200 people in the middle of the jungle, moving around like work ants. Men, women, and children. We were set up in our own hut. Two beds, table, chair. It was actually pretty nice. I lay down for a minute to take a nap, and Juan and Roger disappeared and went off somewhere. When I finally awoke, it was sundown, and a fire pit started everywhere. Roger was sitting there with Juan and Dantes, laughing and joking. Back in those days, he was way more charismatic, far from this obsessed personality that he has today. That's why they laid out the plans. We were to get up at first light, and Roger and Juan were going to fly over to Columbia to get supplies. Dantes and I were to take one of the large jeeps, six men, and head out to the area where locals were mining the gold. We would leave those six men there overnight to build huts and make preparations for us to arrive the next day. We spent the rest of the night sitting there drinking, laughing, and joking. And then the following morning, Roger and I parted ways. And I was left there to deal with Dantes. He turns out he was way more talkative than I would ever imagine. In fact, this dude talked the entire ride as we slowly maneuvered our way down this half-washed out road headed to the location. He talked about his family, how his mother and father were murdered in a drug war with the Colombians. He bragged about being shot 10 times like he was Tupac and not dying. He told me about when he was hitting the head with a machete and how some of the workers rebelled against him and Juan. This man had been dealt some major shit in his lifetime. And he was only 32 years old. Now, I don't know if any of you guys ever spent time in the jungles. It's different from the woods in North America. It's hot, humid, the air is thin, and every breath is a struggle. You find yourself sweating profusely. And soon, I was taking off my shirt just like Dante's. 
Riding in the Jeep was the only positive thing about this trip. Just a little air circulating to cool me down. It was like having your own personal spot in hell. It was just that hot. And Dante has continued to surprise me. I didn't realize he was a hands-on kind of guy. When we hopped out of the Jeep, he grabs a chainsaw and begins to help clear the trees with the other guys. And within the first three hours, they had the first structure completely built. It was crude at first. Pretty much a small log structure, but they claimed by tomorrow, it would have a tile roof to protect us from the rains. This was something I had to see. While they worked, I venture off a little to explore. Carrying the AK-47 that Dante's gave me. It gave me a stern warning about the Jaguars. Telling me to keep my eyes up on the trees if I wanted to live. And then he told me to follow the sounds of the waterfall. And eventually I would find what gold was being mined by the people of the villages. After traveling about 300 feet through the dense jungle, I came across a trail. It's fairly worn, and up ahead, I could hear the sounds of people talking. I walked for a few more feet, and then the jungle brush opened up. And it was like I beheld paradise or something. Imagine the most beautiful landscape. To my left was this waterfall. Water flowed down, creating this vast pool. And then that pool flowed down into a small river, where people were everywhere. It felt like I had stumbled upon the most beautiful ecosystem known to man. I'd never seen anything like this except for on postcards. The locals even waved and were very friendly. Further down the river, I could see men panning for gold. This was amazing. I stood there looking up at this waterfall, awestruck by its intense beauty. Then it hit me. This is where we were going to bring heavy equipment and mine for gold? We are going to fucking destroy this place. At that point in time, I was conflicted and so deep in thought that I hadn't even realized that Dantes walked up behind me until he said... Beautiful, isn't it? It's been this way since I was a little boy. But come now, we must prepare to go. This place we must leave now and get back to our camp. I have a long ride ahead of us and need to be away from here before dark. Dante stared attentively at the waterfall as he said this. And for a brief moment, I saw a look of concern on his face. But in those days, I was completely ignorant and naive to the dangers of the night. But looking back on that moment... If I knew then what I know now, I would have suspected something. We walked the 300 feet or so back to the jungle to the area where we had parked the truck, hopped in and prepared to depart. But another strange sign was the workers. Now I understand these guys didn't have much of a choice. They were working for a drug cartel so they did what they were told to do. But they had this look on their face. Not a look of fear, but a look of helplessness. Like they didn't want to stay there all night, but they had no choice. In reality, they didn't. And they stood there and watched us as we drove away with these blank looks on their faces. Almost like they were coming to terms with the fact that they were going to have to stay there the whole night. Although I was able to observe these things, I wouldn't understand the significance of it to the very next morning when we returned.